letter G, letter G on our outline on page six is our seventh change in Judaism, which is the topic that we've been looking at, the broader one, in the period between the Testaments. And it is similar to letter D, which was our just brie very brief discussion of the monarchy, in that both G and D are negative changes. That is, they are the loss of something in the period between the Testaments, where all of the others have been additions. Of the three important Old Testament offices, the prophet, the priest, and the king, only one of those survives the intertestamental period, and that is the office of the priest. And, of course, we know from our earlier studies that it itself uh, doesn't escape unscathed, but it goes through some rather radical changes. The monarchy, letter D, is lost, the office of the king. Letter G, where we begin tonight, the ministry of the prophet is lost. So those are two negative changes, the loss of something, the loss of something in the Jewish commonwealth and in the Jewish religion. Uh, even the kingship was a part of their religion according to the Old Testament. They've lost the monarchy, the king, they've lost prophetism, the ministry of the prophet. Only one of those three great Old Testament offices survives, prophet, priest, and king, and that's the center one, the second one, the priest. But he goes through some rather radical changes. Malachi and company were the last Old Testament prophets until the time of John. John is really what we could say the last Old Testament prophet. Jesus even said that in places like uh, Matthew 11 and Luke 16, that until John the law was, and since then the kingdom of heaven is preached and men press into it. So John is even included, although he's not in our canon of the Old Testament. His prediction is certainly there in Isaiah and Malachi, and his ministry forms not only the conclusion to the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, but the beginning of the New. Um, he's a horizon-type figure, standing upon the horizon. He can look in both directions, the transitional ministry uh, John the Baptist uh, exercised. There, of course, continue to be prophets, however, in the New Testament, but these are Christian prophets and not Jewish ones. Agabus was a Christian prophet. The book of Acts talks about him in Acts chapter 21. He was a Christian prophet. Uh, Jesus, we are told, has established that ministry in the church in Ephesians 4.11. Well, you don't have to go that far in Ephesians. In Ephesians 2.20, the church is established upon the foundation of the holy apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. One of the ways in Ephesians 2.20, by the way, that I think that you prove Paul's reference to prophets there is not an Old Testament prophet, but a New Testament, is that uh, they follow, come after, a reference to the apostles. The apostles come first, and then the prophets come after that. If what he was really saying is that the church is founded somehow on the Old Testament and the New, or somehow founded on the ministry of Old Testament um, uh, uh, ministers of God, they would be called prophets, and New Testament ones called, called apostles, and surely the term prophet would logically precede that apostle. But it doesn't in Ephesians 2.20. It follows. I think those are, I'm positive, those are Christian New Testament prophets. and not Now, they may be Jews racially, in their ethnic background, but they are part of the Christian faith. Uh, but with the Old Testament ministry of the prophet passing away, then what we have, at least in popular recognition, is their uh, successors, the scribes. And I closed last week's study with this statement that the scribes are the successors to the prophets of the Old Testament as the authoritative voice of God. And I was questioned afterwards by someone on the front row. I see they're not here tonight. That's okay. I think they're on vacation. Um, and I, I, I had to qualify it, but I had it qualified, and I meant for it to be qualified. It's qualified in tonight's notes, and I, that's by the phrase, in popular recognition. <clears throat> doesn't mean that God approved of the fact that the scribes took over the role of the prophets. He certainly didn't. But in popular recognition... I mean, the people had to have someone to speak for God. No king is around, and the priests, well, they have a sacrificial role. They're not speakers to the people, 
but speakers to God on behalf of the people. So who fulfills now uh, an empty slot here, an empty role? The prophets are now gone. Well, the scribes, at least in the eyes of some of the people. We see this uh, double standard in the thinking of the people that the, the scribes were um, afforded this place of high eminence and recognition as being a voice of authority because authorities are generally looked up to by the underlings. But at the same time, the people were rather suspicious of them. A double standard, I think, that probably has been throughout history, and we certainly see it in our society around us. Amen. So we don't have much to say about the prophets because there aren't any. I mean, there aren't any Jewish prophets. Judaism has lost that. So you see letter G is rather uh, stark and bare on your outline. But there's nothing to say about them. They aren't here. They're gone. Nothing to say about the monarchy. It existed. It disappeared in the period between the Testaments. And according to Hosea 3, it won't be resurrected until the last days. The prophets, as far as the Jews are concerned, that also disappeared in the period between the Testaments. So what I want to come to next is the next section on our outline, Jewish religious sex, S-E-C-T-S, Jewish religious sex. Very important area of study in either the New Testament or in the intertestamental period, where you want to find time and a place to put it because they figure so prominently in the Gospels. We see Jewish religious sects, 1 through 7. The Hasidim, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, Essenes, Herodians, Zealots, and the Sanhedrin. What I'd like to do is to begin with a few things by way of introduction before we get into specifically to Numbers 1, 2, and following. First, a few things by way of introduction. Number one, the three most important religious parties, in other words, the three most eminent numbers of one to seven under letter H, are numbers two, three, and four. I kind of want you to know what's important and what isn't, relatively speaking, so you know where we'll concentrate a lot of our attention. Numbers 2, 3, and 4. You have to look on your outline and see who or what I'm talking about or just be no numbers to you. Pharisees, Sadducees, and the Essenes. Now, the last group's not mentioned in the New Testament, the last of those three. The Essenes are not mentioned in the New Testament, but they are extremely important. And I think that they figure in rather prominently in the New Testament period, although... For whatever reason, we'll look at that more later, they're not included in the New Testament narrative. <clears throat> and let me also say that there are other Jewish religious sects that exist beside these that I've given to you here. Three of these are very important, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Essenes. The others of these are not as important. Others which don't figure in on our list are even less important. There are probably, you know, as many sects as you've got people who want to found a sect and have disciples. About as many sects as we have denominations, we could say. Some are important. You know, the Lutherans and the Catholics and the Baptists and the Methodists. And, and then there are probably just a whole lot of denominations that you've never heard of that exist right here in this country. There's supposed to be 20,000, according to one dictionary. 250 of those are more or less rather well-known, and you see how many thousands that leaves that are not very well-known. So I guess you probably have the same situation or something analogous to that in those days, about as many religious sects as you do people who want to found it and have disciples who follow them. But we don't have a lot of information. Uh, we have a few names beyond what I've given you on the outline, but how many existed then about whom we know neither uh, extensive information or even their name. We know nothing about them, so there wouldn't be a lot to talk about. We're going to concentrate on these seven and specifically on numbers two, three, and four. Okay, secondly, another comment by way of introduction. We are actually going to start with number two, the Pharisees. And there's a good reason, and that is because the Hasidim, or the Hasidim, 
are the ancestors of the Pharisees. The Hasidim don't figure into the New Testament because they have passed off the scene and what was them has become the Pharisees. So in one way we could say the Hasidim and the Pharisees are the same group. They just figure in two different periods of Israel's history. The Hasidim or the second century BC, the Pharisees more in the time of Jesus. So when are we going to discuss the Hasidim? Well, we'll mention them somewhere in the midst of our discussion of the Pharisees, probably somewhere near the beginning of our discussion of the Pharisees, since they are the ancestors of them. And also, concerning relations between these various groups, there's going to be some overlapping between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And that's because we see them together so often in the New Testament. Often it, you see the Pharisees and Sadducees. I mean, even the same sentence, not just somewhere throughout the Gospels, but in the same sentence, you see the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And that, as we'll see later, will bring up some interesting questions since the Pharisees and Sadducees were actually adversaries, opponents of one another. It brings up interesting questions as to why they were ever placed together by the Gospel writers. So the Hasidim won't figure in very much in our discussion except with probably what I'll say tonight about the Pharisees, starting back with their history, letter A under number two, the Pharisees. The Sadducees are going to pop up independently. They'll be studied and mentioned on their own, number three, after the Pharisees, but we're going to hear about them several times before we even get to them. They'll have to be discussed to discuss the Pharisees then things we can't say about the Pharisees because those things relate too intimately with the Sadducees will have to be saved until we get to the Sadducees to discuss them. Then Essenes, Herodians, Zealots, and Sanhedrin uh, will follow. Then a third introductory comment. This is just to orient us. The last name of those Jewish religious sects is a little unusual because it's not actually a Jewish religious sect, the Sanhedrin. That's a religious body. It's not a sect. It's a religious, religio-judicial body, let's say. A judicial body that had power primarily in religious matters, but it could pass in civil areas as well. The Sanhedrin, in other words, is not an actual sect like these others. All of these others are sects. Sect, um, that's a rather pejorative term, I would admit. I can't think of anything better. It, it would be anachronistic to call them denominations. We just mean religious groups here. I guess you could call, it depends on what your definition is of sect and cult and denomination or organization, but for this period it seems it'd be best to call them sect. We could call them group if that uh, sounds more positive. But the Sanhedrin is actually not a Jewish religious sect or group, but I don't think there's really any other, and there's certainly no better place to put them, or it, the Sanhedrin, than where we're discussing it right now as a Jewish religious sect. And that's because uh, it was made up, at least in two-thirds of its part, by the priest and by the scribes. We've already discussed the priests and the scribes before as being themselves uh, religious groups, affiliations of people. And when we discuss the Sanhedrin, we'll have to go back and draw on our knowledge of the chief priests and the scribes because they make up two-thirds of it. Then we'll have to look at another group that makes up the final third, but which isn't a religious sect. They're not even mentioned on here. They're assumed or subsumed under the name Sanhedrin. Are you following all this so far? Okay. Then number four, why, why do we have these sects? You don't have them in the Old Testament. So here's a very interesting question. Why do we have the sects arising in the period between the Testaments? You just don't have all of these different... You've got political divisions, but you don't have all these different religious divisions 
with different religious ideas and notions that are distinctive of one group or another. Well, I, I think that it's probably a combination of reasons in our attempt to answer this question. Number one is something that we've already said, letter G. You don't have the prophets. The prophets were the ones who came, a little bit unlike the scribes, saying, Thus says the Lord. In other words, they were the uh, propounders and teachers of the truly authoritative revelation and religion. I mean, how could you deviate? If you deviate, you're a false prophet then. If you deviate, um, God casts you off. If you don't have the prophets around, I mean, the church, the Christian church, has experienced the same thing in, in her uh, history. You don't have the 12 apostles around, and right away people begin to splinter off, and a, a leader comes up here, and people go off there, and what will happen when the apostles were still alive, to be sure? But you don't have, all, you don't have any denominations in the first century like you see develop over history. You lose that direct channel to God, the Old Testament prophets, and it's kind of every man uh, to himself then. They can invent their own ideas and invent their own religions. I think that's part, maybe that's more of a subjective reason, but that's part of uh, an answer to the question, why? Why do we have these religious sects appearing here and not, let's say, earlier? And, and really the question later is not a question. Another answer, another reason, uh, another answer to this question, why, would be the Jews' experience in the dispersion. They, for the first time on foreign soil, had come into contact with a lot of different, to them, I guess, interesting ideas, religious and uh, civil and metaphysical areas, I suppose. They had come into contact on foreign soil with many new and interesting ideas. Babylonian and Persian theology were rather complex, written and oral. And the Jews began picking up and then began emphasizing some of the things that they felt were latent in their own theology, their own theological heritage, back to the Law of Moses, that they found so explicitly taught in some of the Middle Eastern religions outside of their own, such as the Babylonian and the Persian, as well as the Indian religions. For example, in the Persian religion, there is a lot of emphasis, as we even see from the apocryphal books, on the supernatural world, especially on the demonic realm. And you see very little emphasis in the Old Testament on uh, what we could call demonology. Really, you see very little emphasis on the devil himself. He's found in a few places, like in Genesis 3 or Job 1 or Zechariah 3. He's found in a few places, but not that many. Well, the Persians and the Babylonians had a rather uh, complex doctrine of demonology. I'm not saying that the Jews borrowed their demonology from the Babylonians or from the Persians. I'm simply saying they were awakened to maybe what they thought was latent in their own theological heritage. The Old Testament certainly recognizes the existence of demons and Satan. I just gave you some references, passages that refer to Satan, some for demons like in the book of Leviticus. Paul makes this explicit in the New Testament where he said that what they sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons. The Old Testament says it's the same, the book of Leviticus. They're uh, false forms of worship, even among the Jews. So I'm not saying they borrowed something directly from Babylonians or from some other Near Eastern religious heritage than their, their own. Uh, but they were certainly awakened to things they felt were latent in their own. And then another, maybe this is even a more complex and uh, more to the issue, answer to that question why they arose due to the complexity and wealth of material in the Old Testament's holiness code then this has to be coupled with that first reason I gave you they lost the ministry of the prophet who was the infallible interpreter of the Old Testament including the Old Testament's holiness code so let me say that again the the rise of all of these sects is it 
at least in part due to the complexity and wealth of material in the Old Testament's holiness code. Sometimes that's used, I guess maybe especially that terminology in critical biblical circles as a reference to the book of Leviticus. It includes other things, but Leviticus would certainly be the locus classicus for that. What do I mean by this? Well, I mean the Sabbath and prescribed foods, how they were to be cooked and how they were to be eaten and what could be eaten and when could they be eaten, uncleanness, the various stipulations about offerings, the Sabbath, what could be done, what couldn't be done, when it began, when it ended, what type of influence and effect it had upon the life of the normal average Jew. You see, there are many possible interpretations. The law left a lot of things open. Uh, the law was given in a, even in a setting of transition, so much of it looking forward to what was going to take place later, later in Palestine. So how much of that which was given in a uh, transition setting, the wilderness wandering experience, was really meant to be carried out once they came into Palestine. There's a different setting now. As a settled people, they were a nomadic people then. How much of that is real or valid for the Palestinian Jewish nation? And you see many of the differences, maybe most of the differences, between these religious sects would go back to important areas as far as um, the Old Testament's holiness code is concerned. Take the matter of the Sabbath. We know that the Sabbath the a Pharisaic interpretation of that is a very important, crucial thing in the four Gospels. There, there's a lot of room left for uh, quote-unquote interpretation. You don't have the prophets around. You don't have someone you can ask. And so you have different religious traditions which formulate their own interpretations, their own understanding of a, an admittedly complex section in the Old Testament, the Holiness Code, the Book of Leviticus, and then they perpetuate that in their own theological heritage. The Sabbath, uncleanness, who's unclean, for how long, what are the reasons, a lot of complicated material. So I think uh, these three things probably combine themselves. The loss of the, uh, the ministry of the prophet, the experience of the Jews in the diaspora, and the complexity, the, the confusion that surrounds the interpretation of the Old Testament's holiness code. Many different possible interpretations because there's so much material in the Law of Moses, especially like in Leviticus and portions of Numbers, Deuteronomy and Exodus, the end of Exodus. There's so much and what is there is rather complex. Take the laws of leprosy. I mean, you've got a couple of chapters, verse after verse after verse. On, well, if you're, the hair is this color and it appears here and then you do this and well, you've got different and varying interpretations of that. So you've got these religious sects or Jewish religious groups arising to fill the need of interpreting it a certain way. You mix that now with the demonology um, uh, aspect of the second answer that I've just given you to this question and uh, I, I think we probably have some type of answer of why these religious sects are rising at this time. Now that's what I want to say by way of introduction. Uh, I want to get into the Pharisees next if you don't have any questions on what I've said thus far. We've got a social as well as a religious and political change in Israel at this time. So it's something that, although it's not just terribly important, it's something important enough to warrant our attention why you've got these sects then and you don't have them before. You don't have them later because you don't have a nation of Israel later. They're destroyed in A.D. 70 and dispersed literally to the four winds of heaven, uh, unlike what they had experienced at the hands of the Babylonians. So the only question would be why we didn't have them earlier. Well, we had the prophets around. Uh, they weren't going through the experience of the diaspora. So you combine all those things with the complexity of the holiness code, and I think this is why... We've got differing opinions. Differing opinions equal different religious sects in the period between the Testaments. Okay, the Pharisees. Let's begin with them. Well known from Sunday school. 
and they really are well known from Sunday school. I'm sure you'll learn some new things about them, but you probably know a lot about them already. Let's start with looking at their history. Let's start at their ne with their name to begin with. What in the world does the name Pharisee mean? Well, you come across different interpretations of the origin of the term Pharisee. The English Pharisee is almost a transliteration of the Greek, which comes from a Semitic term of contested meaning. Scribe, which we have just um, finished looking at, of course, isn't a transliteration of something in the Greek. You know the difference between a translation and a transliteration. Rabbi is a transliteration. Pharisee isn't quite, but it almost is a transliteration of the Greek, and the Greek comes from a Semitic term that has a rather contested meaning. Let me give you several different uh, alternatives as to what the Semitic term behind our name Pharisee means. First of all, one guess is that what Pharisee really means is a Persianizer. A Persianizer, spelled after Persians from Persia, the kingdom of Persia. A Persianizer. And they have some support, I would say, for this assumption. What they would mean, if this is true, what was meant then by the term Pharisee is it was coined in ridicule. It was coined in ridicule. It'd be analogous to the coining of the term Christian or Christian by the pagans in Antioch in Acts 11, verses 25 and 26. It was coined in ridicule of this group's beliefs in a spirit world. I just talked about the Persians, Persian theology. They had a rather elaborate demonology. They had a rather elaborate view of the spirit world, whether of demons or of angels, angelology or demonology. Coined in ridicule, so if you call someone a Persianizer, it means they are characterized by something that characterized the Persians, something that evidently other Jews may have laughed at, mocked, thought of in ridicule. So. Pharisee means Persianizer in the Hebrew, and it's coined in ridicule of their uh, belief in the spirit world, as well as, I might add, bodily resurrection. Beliefs which also characterize Persian theology. Now, we're going to see later in our study, we should know enough from the New Testament already, that this question of the spirit world and the question of a bodily resurrection figures in very importantly in the New Testament, especially in differences between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Sadducees were the ones who brought to him this hypothetical thing of a woman who had seven husbands, all of whom died, therefore in the resurrection. The Pharisees never address a question concerning the resurrection to him. The Sadducees do, because they don't believe in it, as we'll see later. The Pharisees do. Uh, concerning the spirit world, we find in a very interesting, almost a side reference over in Acts chapter 23, that the Pharisees believe in spirits and in the resurrection, believe in spirits and in the resurrection, and the Sadducees deny them all. They deny the resurrection, they deny spirits. Spirit or angels, we're told over in Acts chapter 23. I don't think this is right, Persianizer. I think it's probably a view of the liberals, because what the liberals want us to I guess what they're after, my, my assumption as to what the liberals would be after, in saying that the Pharisees were, were called in ridicule Persianizers because that which characterized Persian theology characterized Pharisaic theology. I think liberals are trying to say that in the Old Testament there is no demonology and there is no belief in bodily resurrection. I mean, how, if that's a Jewish belief, then why would you call someone a Persianizer in, in ridicule of them because they believe what the Persians believe when you believe that, when all the Jews believe that? I don't, I don't see any way under the sun that this Persianizer view could be right. I think this is a good uh, 
um, although I haven't read this anywhere, I think this is probably a, a standard outworking of liberal theology. Call the Pharisees that, say that they were called this because of this particular reason, and thereby you deny that the Old Testament has anything to say about a spirit world or the resurrection of the body. And that just happens to be two of the things that not only the Sadducees deny, but the liberals deny. The liberals don't believe in a spirit world. They laugh at the idea of angels and demons and things like that. They don't believe that's real. Now, that may have been some foreign mythology, uh, notably a Persian mythology, but it's not Old Testament biblical theology, they would say. Of course, I believe the Old Testament does teach both of those. It does teach both bodily resurrection as well as the existence and belief in a spirit world. Amen. We just gave you a lot of references for a spirit world earlier. What about bodily resurrection? Well, you could start anywhere, but how about starting at the end over in Daniel chapter 12? Clearly speaks Amen. of two resurrections. Daniel 12 and verse 2 Amen. speaks of two different resurrections, two different bodily resurrections. For the continuation of this in Daniel chapter 12 clearly speaks Amen. of two resurrections. Daniel 12 and verse 2 Amen. speaks of two different resurrections, two different bodily resurrections. And there are other references. Psalm 73 seems to mention a resurrection, a life after death. Book of Job certainly seems to make reference to a life after death in the flesh, in my flesh, I will behold my Redeemer. And there seem to be other references to a life after death which would equal, in the biblical sense, bodily resurrection. Now, the liberal contention is, well, there may be life after death, but that doesn't assume bodily resurrection. Well, I think life after death in the biblical understanding, the biblical sense of life after death, must include bodily resurrection because the Old Testament as well as the New Testament recognizes man as, as one corporate personality, body, soul, and spirit, and he's not complete without his body. And so to say or to teach life after death without bodily resurrection would be to teach life after death forever in eternity in an incomplete state without the body. Whenever Jesus disproves the Sadducean theory of no bodily resurrection, how does he do that? But by reference to the fact that God, when he appeared to Moses, said that I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But wait a minute, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob weren't in some resurrected state. We'll get to that question later. A lot of people know what, know that, that that's what he said and that's how he refutes it. But then if you think a little deeper, you would ask yourself the question, well, how does that refute anything, though? What they're after is a resurrection of the body. They don't believe in it, the Sadducees. Jesus, in refuting them, said, you don't know the power of God. He's got the power to raise the body from the dead. And you don't know the scriptures. And then he quotes one of their scriptures in Exodus chapter 3. When he appeared to Moses, he said, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But what are Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Where are they? How do they exist? When Jesus is saying as well as when I'm saying it, but in a non-bodily, non-resurrected state. How does that prove, or how does that disprove, how does that prove bodily resurrection? How does that disprove the view of the Sadducees? Well, we'll get to that later. We discuss their view of bodily resurrection. But the liberal view might be that we could have life after death without bodily resurrection, but that's just far into the New Testament. That may be Persian uh, theology. It really isn't. It may be Greek theology. It, it really isn't, but it's certainly not biblical. So I don't think Persianizer is right. I think that's a liberal claim. Secondly, another guess. What do we mean by the name Pharisee? The root word can mean to expound, to expound. So Pharisee means an expounder of something. What? Well, probably of the law an expounder of the law. The Pharisees were expounders of the law. But that runs into, collides with the specific role of the scribes, as we've seen. 
And the scribes, as I've also said, and we've somewhat seen, are not coterminous with the Pharisees. So I don't think that's going to hold a lot of water. Thirdly, generally the root means separated. And that's how it's generally understood. That's the standard interpretation by most scholars. Persianizer or the expounders of the law are minority opinions. Generally, the word in its root form means separated. So it would mean for the Pharisees, the separated ones. The separated ones. Or to use a theological term, the holy ones. or the true community of Israel. I did find it interesting that Morris, in his commentary on John, favorably, very favorably mentions Manson's choice of Persianizers, but then he concludes with this statement on page 139 in the 31st note. Whatever be the truth about the origin of the name Pharisees, or oh, the name, the Pharisees were the party of strict orthodoxy. Whatever be the truth about the origin of the name, the Pharisees were the party of strict orthodoxy. So although Morris seems to kind of lean toward Manson's choice of um, an entomological origin for the term Pharisee, in its practical outworking, I think he goes with the standard interpretation. And that is that the Pharisees were the orthodox, the strictly orthodox ones, the separate ones, the holy ones, the true community of Israel. Whether they call themselves that or were called that by others is another matter. It would be rather um, boastful to call yourself the true community or the separated ones or the holy ones. Others could in derision certainly call them that because they were a holier-than-thou people, a holier-than-thou sect or group, a phrase that, no, wasn't founded by evangelicalism, but it's found back in the book of Isaiah, holier-than-thou. So separated ones, well, separated from what or from whom? Well, that will be our next question, the next point that we need to address, which is their origin in early history their origin in early history. I think, in other words, here under the name Pharisees, that that's what the term means. That the term means the separated ones. It doesn't mean Persianizers. It doesn't mean expounders. It means separated ones. Separated means the holy ones. Sep if you're separate, you're separate from something. And the theological terminology, you'd be called the Holy One, so you would naturally see yourself as the true community of Israel. Your separation must be from something that's either in or affecting Israel, or the whole nation of Israel would be called Pharisees, because they're all separate, or they're supposed to be in their theology and life and practice from the world. So the Pharisees must mean something more by that or whoever they were that called the Pharisees the Pharisees. So let's come to their origin. The first thing to say about their origin is it's mysterious. It's, it's uh, impossible to know uh, precisely what their origin was, when and who and where definitely the movement of the Pharisees arose because it's all uh, shrouded in mystery. But on the other hand, I think there are some um, rather obvious, evident things that we can say. The name Pharisees and the group first appear during the intertestamental period. And that's definite. That can be proven. Now, I know we probably all already understand this, but we probably also take it for granted. I mean, there are no Pharisees in the Old Testament. And they're just linking out the scenes of the Gospels. So remember, that's our whole purpose in this whole class for a few years now is to understand what's been going on between the close of the old and the opening of the new because what is not found in the old 
I mean in many different areas. What is not found in the old is linking out the seams of the new. And so it's kind of up to us either to find out, well, the origin of, the, of these terms or ideas or groups or movements, um, or I guess the other alternative, which would be the alternative of a lot of people, just say, well, who cares? It doesn't really make any difference one way or the other. But it does if we want to understand the New Testament. If we want to understand the changes that took place between Malachi and Matthew, then that means we want to understand the New Testament because the oil is going to help us a lot in most of our areas. In most areas, it will help us more than anything else. But then when it comes to some of these particular groups or movements that aren't mentioned in the oil, we'll have to have some extra material. So concerning their origin, we have seen earlier with the scribes that the captivity has gone a long way in changing the people. The focus of the people shifts from the temple increasingly upon the law, a strict study and interpretation and practice of the law. If you look in Malachi 4.4, 4, the Jews kind of thought that they were given a last warning as they would look back to their Old Testament of the importance of the law, therefore the importance of focusing their attention upon that, a strict study, interpretation, and in pra practice of it. Malachi 4.4. 4. Now, this is in the very early post-exilic period, Malachi's writings and experience. In Malachi 4.4, 4, we read, Remember ye, now Israel is taking this in the 2nd century B.C. and the 1st century A.D. as a writing to herself. Remember ye the law. I mean, take, put yourself in the place of a Jew in the second century B.C. Remember ye the law of Moses my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and the judgments. Now you've been in the ITP, they didn't call it that, but you've been in that for a few hundred years. Malachi's prophecy is now a couple of hundred years old, and you've noticed, you've noticed this, we can prove this from some of the apocryphal references, you have noticed no prophets have popped up over the last couple of hundred years. And it kind of begins to register on some people. Malachi was the end. And what did Malachi have to say to us? But almost the last thing he had to say. Malachi 4.4, 4, remember the law. Remember the law of Moses. With the judgments, with the statutes, all the teachings, the holiness code, all the statutes. Remember the law of Moses. We see biblical exposition by qualified teachers in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. We saw this in studying the scribes. Teachers and disciples uh, began to form places of instruction, which eventually became the synagogues. Ecclesiasticus 51.23 speaks of a teaching house, a teaching house, Ecclesiasticus 51.23. So, although the Pharisees do not, contrary to the second interpretation of the name, become the authoritative, official, regular teachers of the Old Testament law, that doesn't mean that they aren't very concerned about the keeping of the law. The scribes, as we will see, actually have a position of authority and of the um, origination of teaching over the Pharisees. But the Pharisees are not unconcerned about the law and the keeping of it. As a matter of fact, they are very, very concerned. In some areas, according to Matthew 23, 23, too concerned. If you could be, they were, and they were, because you can be, because Jesus said that. They were too concerned about things that he did not include among the weightier matters of the Old Testament. And those things they were so concerned about, which did involve the law, did involve specifically the Old Testament holiness code. So in order to really understand the origin of this group of people as a separate group, the Pharisees, we have to go back to the days of the Maccabees. And I think we see their origin here under their ancestors, the Hasidim. 
I'm going to have to give you a little bit of the history, and we've gone over this before, although it's been a long time ago, but I think that a lot of this will stand out in your mind because the picture that I will paint will be a rather broad one. Now, the Hasidim, you see them back on your outline. The, the, the H there in Hebrew is really the, the CH or the hard H, the K, the Hasidim, but you can pronounce it Hasidim. And you see it also as the Hasidians. You see it various other ways also in other writings. But we'll just call them, for sake of simplicity, the Hasidim. H-A-S-I-D-I-M. Here's what basically took place. During the reign of Antiochus IV Epiphanes, there was a great struggle in Israel between those who want to apostatize to the Syrian lords, the Hellenists, and those who want to remain pure in their faith. You should remember in the political part of this class a long time ago, we incorporated a lot of the 11th chapter of Daniel into the study because Daniel was very reliable in his prediction of what would take place politically later on. The Jews living in Palestine, living at kind of a bridge or a gateway between two whole continents, Asia and Africa, found themselves in a very tension-filled environment. You've got those to the south of them, the Egyptians, the Greeks, the Ptolemies, as we discussed them earlier, wanting their land and wanting to control them. And those to the north, the Seleucids or the Syrians who want to control them. And there's a seesaw battle back and forth over a period of several hundred years as to who's going to end up controlling the land of Palestine. Well, the Ptolemies start off in control. They control for a hundred years. They lose their control and the Seleucids, the Syrians, to the north of Israel take over. Now, whenever they take over under various leaders like Antiochus the Great, who comes earlier, then Antiochus the Fourth, descendant of his, who's also known as Antiochus Epiphanes, who is a type of the Antichrist, the little horn in Daniel 11 and uh, Daniel chapter 7 and 8, Whenever they take over, they attempt to introduce into the land of Israel thoroughly Greek, Hellenistic, that is, pagan elements, both into their politics and then later on into their religion. And all types of foreign um, influences, pagan, Greek, Hellenistic, Syrian, Seleucid influences are brought into the land of Palestine, both politically and religiously. For a whole lot of the Jews who now have had no prophet, no fresh revelation from God for several hundred years, um, who are living in a state of apostasy themselves, who are living in a state of irreligion or no religion, um, what is brought in by the Greeks or by the Seleucids to the north is no big deal unless it's a good deal for them. And they're going to get in on this and experience some of the expansions in their intellect and politics and their religion. There are a few people, evidently not that many, who want to remain pure, who believe that these influences brought in by the Greeks to the north are um, seriously damaging the health, spiritually and otherwise, of the nation of Israel. If you turn over to the book of Daniel, we'll see some of these references in Daniel 11. Let's start with... Um, Verse 31, Daniel 11:31. It seems like most of the people want to go over to the other side. A few want to remain pure. Arms shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. And they that understand among the people shall instruct many. Yet they shall fall by the sword and by flame, by captivity, and by spoil many days. Now when they shall fall, they shall be holpen with a little help. But many shall cleave to them with flatteries. And some of them of understanding shall fall to try them and to purge and to make them white even to the time of the end because it is yet for a time appointed. Now we got a detailed exposition of all of those verses on earlier tapes. Suffice it to say now, 
several different groups, really more than two, but several different groups of people are mentioned here among the Jews. Those who want to apostatize, those who want to remain faithful. The people who want to apostatize, who are Jews, are themselves called Hellenists because they want to accept the Greek form of philosophy. The people who want to remain pure religiously are called the Hasidim. All right, so now we're coming upon who these people, the Hasidim, are. They are called the Hasidim in the Apocrypha. Let me give you some references that we won't look up. 1 Maccabees 162. 1 Maccabees 2.29 and 2.42. Those who want to remain pure are called the Hasidim. They're called that in those places as well as elsewhere, in the Apocrypha and out. And we discuss this historical situation in some detail on these tapes, lit 59 through 62, when we looked at the books of the Apocrypha. We, of course, also discussed it in some detail earlier in this class. Now, the Maccabees, since we mentioned their book, First Maccabees, the Maccabees are the political militant force in Israel that drives the Syrians out and punishes the Hellenistic Jews. And that takes place over a period of several years as the uh, sons of the priest Mattathias take over in succession uh, this I guess what could best be described as a uh, guerrilla revolt. The Maccabees are the political militant force in Israel. And the Hasidim aren't that. It drives the Syrians out and punish the, punishes the Hellenistic Jews. They do this along with the sympathetic encouragement <coughs> of the religiously minded Hasidim. <coughs> The Hasidim are on the side of the Maccabees, but they're on their side only so far and for a certain given purpose and reason. Now, we know from history and from our earlier studies that the Maccabees are very successful. In 165 B.C., they succeed in driving the foreigners, the pagans, out of their land. They recapture the temple and sacrifice is reinstituted and restored. Now at this point, the Hasidim see no need for continue, continued fighting. I mean, in other words, the only thing they were after is religious freedom. They supported the Maccabees, I think on the basis of a misunderstanding, because the Hasidim assumed that the Maccabees were of the same mental framework, the same religious framework. Now, the Maccabees were religious people, but they were more religio-political people than they were just religious. The Hasidim were religious people. They weren't really too concerned about where the Greeks were or where they weren't as long as they had their temple and sacrifice. As long as they could worship God as their forefathers had, that was their basic concern. Once the political impetus was over. The Syrians had been driven out. The Hasidim saw no need to keep on fighting. Judas Maccabeus and his brothers, of course, continue the war because the Maccabees want complete, absolute political freedom. And so as a result, we see a splitting of these two groups, the Maccabees. This is very important, so don't let me lose you here and the Hasidim. Now, on a few later occasions, it's expedient and necessary for the Hasidim to rejoin the Maccabees because of the treachery of some of the Syrians. Uh, but that rejoining is short-lived. 1 Maccabees 7, verses 12 to 18, and 2 Maccabees 14, 6. To be sure, we see later in history the Hasidim are back with the Maccabees, but it's temporary. It's short light. 1 Maccabees 7, verses 12 to 18, and 2 Maccabees 14, 6. Now, 
that's all the history. Now let me conclude and I'll try to reduce all of that to something even easier to understand, more simple than that, and I'll reduce it to something that real specifically applies to what we find on our outline. In Josephus, in Josephus, now he's a late first century AD historian, we have our first historical reference to the Pharisees and Sadducees. That doesn't mean they're appearing in the time of Josephus for the first time. He's simply the first one who writes their name down that we have extant. He makes a reference to them first appearing in the time of John Hyrcanus, who was himself a descendant of Judas Maccabeus. And here's what the situation seems to be. I'm discussing this under two heads. A, the Pharisees, and B, the Sadducees. Josephus first mentions them as popping up during the time of John Hyrcanus, and he mentions them by name, that they were then known by that name, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And here's what the situation seems to be. The Pharisees, they are descendants of the Hasidim and are opposed to two things. The Pharisees are the descendants of the Hasidim, and they are opposed to two things. Number one, the political power and ambition of the Hasmonean dynasty. That's another way of saying the descendants of the Maccabees. They were suspicious of that of the political power and ambition of the Hasmonean dynasty. And, and this is, becomes even more important, secondly, something else they were opposed to, they were opposed to the fact that the Hasmoneans had appointed an hereditary high priesthood. In their family, even though they did not descend from Aaron. Now, I'll say all of that again. I have enough time to be long-winded or rather detailed or repetitive with these last statements. They are the descendants, the Pharisees, of the Hasidim who are opposed to, number one, the political power and ambitions of Judas Maccabeus and company. And they're opposed to the fact that Judas Maccabeus and company, really not Judas, but those who follow him, the Hasmoneans, they appoint an hereditary high priesthood in their own family, even though they do not descend from Aaron. All right, so here's what I want you to understand. The Hasidim, I think, were smart enough back second century, mid late to mid-2nd century B.C. They were smart enough to recognize that, that the Maccabees, although they might, may not at that time, at the initial time of their desire to, to push the Syrians out, had any you know, future religious thoughts in their mind, the Hasidim were smart enough to realize that if they succeed so powerfully in the political and in the military realm, then, then that's going to leave some type of vacuum once the Syrians are gone. Now, the Maccabees can fill the political vacuum, but isn't it also the tendency, as history has proven, for those in political or governmental or military power to also assume the role of the religious people, the rel religious sphere? And I think this is what the Hasidim are guessing and they're suspicious of, and they happen to be right in their assumption. That's why I think they went only so far with the Maccabees, and they didn't go all the way. They felt if we get our temple back, let's stop and just go back to being Jews. Of course, the nation of Israel couldn't. They were forever changed as a result of that. The Hasmoneans established a political dynasty, not based on the Davidic line or anything, and then through that, established a religious dynasty, established a high priesthood in their own family, also without any precedent or support in the Old Testament. Here it would have to be uh, from the descent of the Old Testament first high priest Aaron. So what we see about the Pharisees is that they are very concerned about religious matters and about strict observance of the law. 
when they knew that this was wrong. So you have to understand the Pharisees in light of their origin. They derive themselves from the Hasidim. And you have to understand the Hasidim in light of this uh, complex series of events taking place in the mid-2nd century B.C. with the Syrians being pushed out by the Maccabees, the Maccabees taking over the political power now left in this vacuum, and then from that extending themselves to religious rulership over the nation. The Hasidim see that as illegitimate, as not based on the Old Testament law, and therefore they are very antagonistic against that. The Pharisees are not a politically minded people. They are very religiously minded people. And then secondly, the Sadducees. Let's conclude with them. So you're seeing already when we mention one, you have to mention the other because these parties go hand in hand because they're after one another's throat. Evidently, the Sadducees, who we know from the New Testament period, let's say, in the New Testament, I think, as well, are the aristocratic nobility. Now, huh, that, that reads very similar to the Maccabees. You see, the Pharisees read similar to the Hasidim and the Sadducees to the Maccabees. Evidently, the Sadducees sprang up as a distinct religious party surrounding this very hereditary high priesthood that was established by the Hasmoneans and condemned by the Pharisees. This is the initial source of much of the mutual antagonism between the two groups. They have other reasons to hate one another later. I think this is the initial source of the mutual antagonism between the two groups. Let me say that again. Evidently, the Sadducees spring up as the um, religio-political counterpart to the Pharisees as the descendants of the Maccabees. This is a rather broad painting, but I think that it's rather true. 